all the stories coming forward are going to be as Jesus is moving toward the cross. All of the stories are going to have to do with what does it mean to follow Jesus, and specifically, what does it mean to follow Jesus uh, into this life of suffering and death. And so that's what we're going to begin to wrestle with this morning. Uh, there's some questions that you'll hear in the text. Uh, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus for us? And then another question, as I said, that we'll be wrestling with is what does it mean uh, to follow this Jesus? So let us open our eyes and our ears and let us listen for the word of God. A reading from the Gospel of Mark. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But who do you say I am? You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the human one must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Then turning, looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Jesus called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any of you want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For those who want to save their lives will, you, will lose it, and those who lose their lives for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it proffer them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the human one will also be ashamed when the human one comes in glory with the, with, with the glory of God and with holy angels. Truly, I tell you, there are some who are standing here who will not taste death until they have seen that the kingdom of God has come to power. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, This is my child, the beloved, listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. This is the word of God, and for the people of God. Will you join me in prayer? O oh, gracious God, as we listen to these ancient words and think about how they impact our lives today, O oh God, open us up to new understandings. Open our eyes to see you in new ways, our ears to hear your voice calling to us, our hearts to feel you with us, and our feet to follow in your way. In your name we pray. Amen. So I'm going to start just with a, uh, a straw poll this morning. And if you were given a choice between winning or losing, how many of you would choose winning? I'm thinking most of us, right? No one I know actually sets out uh, to lose. No one I know says, yeah, sign me up for hard times or suffering. No one I know says, yeah, I'd love uh, to really enter into the brokenness and the messiness of the world. But if we listen to our scripture reading this morning, uh, we hear one of the biggest challenges of our faith. 
that to follow Jesus, to follow Jesus the Messiah, means that we will follow him in the ways of suffering and death, and that we, we will be asked to lose our lives for the sake of something greater. Now, I don't know about you, but this doesn't sound like the best marketing plan uh, for the church, right? Uh, become a Christian so you can suffer, or join LOUCC so you can lose your life. But this is the countercultural message that our faith asks of us. To truly follow Jesus, we must deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow. Lose our lives in order to save them. So what on earth does this mean? And how on earth do we live this out? Well, welcome to Lent. Or welcome to the Sunday before Lent. Because this is what we are going to be wrestling with for the next six weeks or so. Uh, I read a quote this morning from, uh, from Richard Rohr, who uh, works for the Center for Action and Contemplation. His daily devotional is going to be one of our Lenten groups uh, this coming season. And in it, there is a, a quote from a man named Claudio, Claudio Naranjo, who uh, writes this. He says, if we consider it difficult for a healthy society to exist without the foundation of healthy individuals, it becomes imperative to recognize the political value of individual transformation. If we consider it difficult for a healthy society to exist without the foundation of healthy individuals, it becomes imperative to recognize the political value of individual transformation. If we put it positive, it says if we want a healthy society, we need healthy individuals. And so we have to look for that individual transformation. Well, this is really what Lent is about, and it's going to be what Lent is about here, the story of transformation, that our theme this year is reaching in and reaching out, reaching inward to do some of that individual transformation in our hearts, to ask God to reorient us and realign us, and then from that place to reach out into the transformation of our world and to be moved by God's justice and love and mercy. Well, in our text this morning, there are two paradoxes that are set forth that help guide us uh, into this journey of transformation and into this journey of Lent. The first is this idea of the suffering Messiah. As I said in the introduction uh, to the scripture reading, up until now, we've been hearing uh, lots of things about Jesus and Mark, but they've been character traits like a prophet, a, teal, a healer, a teacher, uh, the one who challenges the status quo. But today, for the very first time, we hear Jesus called the Messiah, and he's called it by one of his disciples. As you saw Bob and Brenda act out, it was when they're on the way, and Jesus asks, well, who do people say that I am? And some say Elijah, some say John the Baptist. And then he says, but who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Messiah, which means the Christ, the anointed one. And this is, this is a loaded term. It's a loaded term for many reasons. For one, the term was, it was a royal term. It was, a, it was a kings who were anointed at the time. And so by calling Jesus the Messiah or the anointed one, it's saying he is truly the king, not, not the emperor, not the other one in charge. And more importantly, for uh, the Jewish understanding, the Messiah was the one who was being called to liberate, the one who was going to come and set the people free, who would start a revolution, who would overthrow the Roman government, who would reinstill the monarchy in Jerusalem, which you may remember uh, Rome had come in and, and crushed the city and crushed the temple. And so this is what Peter has in mind when he says, you are the Messiah. He's seen the power and the, uh, of Jesus and thinks this is the one who is going to overthrow. But then Jesus starts to describe what his Messiahship is going to look like. And he says it's going to be marked by suffering, by rejection from the religious leaders, by death, by the political forces. And after three days, I will rise again. This kind of Messiah that Jesus is talking about is totally different from the status quo. It was totally different from the expectations, totally different from the power and the violence of Rome, totally different even from the boundaries and the markers of the religious society. His Messiahship was marked by nonviolence, by compassion, by inclusion, and by love. 
all the things that Jesus has been teaching and modeling all along, and it's these things that are going to get him killed. Because what he is doing is challenging all the structures that are in place to ensure that there are winners and losers, that there is us and a them, that some people are in and some people are out. And yet, this is a journey that Jesus asks us to join in. To join in the suffering and in compassion of others, which means we may end up suffering along the way ourselves. It's no wonder, then, that Peter wants to rebuke him. But Jesus says, no, you are placing your mind on human interests and not on the interests of God. Human interest, we know, is self-interest. We always want to look out for number one. And Jesus says that, no, that there is a different way, that if you're to be my followers, you're to pick Deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. And then he introduces this second paradox, this enigmatic statement that says, for those who want to save their lives will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and the sake of the gospel will save it. And this, I think, is one of the biggest conundrums and challenges of our faith. Because in it, Jesus is asking us to give up our self-interest, to give up our own self-centeredness for the sake of the good news, for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of something greater, God's love, God's mercy, and God's justice. And I was thinking about this text this week, and I was trying to think about how I would talk about this or illustrate it. And then I happened to go to my son's um, basketball game yesterday. And Hudson, my older son, he's in kindergarten. He's just learning how to play basketball. We enrolled him about a month ago. And this is like very much the fundamentals of basketball. It's kind of cute. I mean, it's like, what is offense, right? What is defense? Which way are we going? Uh, what does it mean to dribble the ball? And how do we learn how to pass the ball? And so his, he's learning all these, these basketball fundamentals. So they get together, they practice, and then they have a little game uh, with another team. And yesterday, the team that they started to play, it was clear from the very beginning that the other team was out to win, like really out to win. They had a, a couple ringers on their team, including this kid, who my kid's tall, but this kid was like freakishly tall, like <laughs> head and shoulders above everybody. It's all kindergarten and first grade. But he, I don't know if he started when he was three or what, but they would just give him the ball, he would run down, fast break, layup. Run down, fast break, layup. He would shoot three-pointers. I mean, the kid's six, you know? And, and uh, it just goes on and on. And then when they were on defense, our team, our little red team, was trying to bring the ball down. And it was like NBA. They're like half-court press. They got picking up man-to-man, -man, trying to steal the ball from these kids that can't even dribble. Do you know what I mean? And needless to say, it wasn't a very fun game to watch, you know? <laughs> But I have to say, I give huge props to the coach of, of Hudson's team because there were kids on Hudson's team, and then there's some kids on his team who play better and were like, give me the ball, I'll take it down. And the coach is like, no. You know, we are here to learn how to play, and we are going to keep passing the ball. And when you bring it down, you're going to pass. And we're going to take turns, and everybody gets a turn to dribble the ball down the court. Everybody gets a turn to shoot the ball. And then he said, and when we're on defense... We're not going to block the shots the way they're blocking our shots. We're going to give them some space to let their kids bring the, bring the ball down, and we're going to let them have a chance to shoot. And as I listened, I thought, well, that'll preach, right? That's kingdom basketball, right? Because what, what the coach is trying to do is saying, look, this is not about your own glory. This is not about, uh, uh, about you showing off all your skills, right? This is about being willing to lose so that everybody gets a chance to play, right? This is about setting aside your special skills so that other people can have a turn. This is about making sure that everybody gets a chance to participate, even if it means you or your team uh, suffers along the way. And I thought, well, this is what Jesus is teaching about, right? That Jesus plays for Team humanity, right? Jesus plays for team creation. And when you are on or we are on Jesus' team, 
Jesus says, you know, this is not about you. This is not about you showing off your skills. This is not about you getting all the points. This is not about you living in all the glory. This is not about you hogging all the power. This is about you serving the common good. This is about you being inclusive. This is about you engaging in justice. This is about you being part of the team, even if you suffer, and even if you get rejected for it. In other words, this is about losing your life for the sake of something greater. And I think this kind of living, this kind of losing, this kind of sacrifice or suffering, it takes all forms. And it's really what we're going to be focusing on as we go into Lent. For some of us, this kind of losing or sacrifice, it may be about giving up some of our financial power. We're going to hear a story about that next week when Jesus uh, talks to a rich young man and asks him to give away his possessions. What would it mean if Jesus came to us and said, can you let go of some of your financial privilege? Can you forego a vacation or a newer car or even a daily or weekly run to Starbucks in order to give that money to somebody else, to pass the ball, as it were. For some of us, this idea of losing or, or sacrifice might be about letting go of our need to be in control, whether it's in control of leadership or decisions. And what would it mean to recognize that there are other people at the table, other people who need to have a say? For some of us, it might be letting go of some of our privilege, which takes so many forms. But one form is maybe giving up the idea that we don't have to care about something because it doesn't apply to us. And so to, to seek to save our lives means to make a conscious decision to learn about someone whose experience is different from our own, whether it's someone of a different race or nationality or sexual orientation or citizenship status to enter their suffering, to find out what their life has been like, and then figure out how can we work together? How can we help? And for some of us, it may be simply letting go of creature comforts to serve the wider good. We have a next door neighbor uh, who's involved in a men's group in his Catholic church, and they just started this 90-day program where they're practicing letting go of different things. So they're fasting for two days, for week example. Andy told us yesterday for three months they're taking cold showers, right? Yeah, that was my reaction too, like no way. But what Jeremy told us is that he's realized, you know what, I actually don't have to have a shower every day then. And in fact, it's better for our planet, right, if I don't shower every day. And so this is what we have to look forward to in Lent, friends. Not cold showers necessarily. <laughs> But these kinds of questions, right, these kinds of challenges um, about how are we hoarding privilege or power or possessions in the name of self-interest or in the name of glory or in the name of comfort or in the name of status? And how might God be calling us to let some of that go, uh, to share what we've been given, to give up some of that, to, to pass the ball, to to pick up our cross and follow. Jesus says that to truly live, we must be willing to die to ourselves and to our self-interest. So how is God calling us to live? And how is God calling us to let go? As we begin this journey of Lent, may God be with us in our living, in our dying, and most importantly, in the transformation of ourselves and of the world. Amen.